Pharrell Williams. Places, spaces I've been. Places and spaces I've been. It's beautiful. Comes in three colors. Yes, sir. Pink, blue, and... Uh, green, but I mean, you know, it's like a... They're all special colors. Yeah, I don't know if you want to say mint or like a light turquoise. I don't know. All right. I mean, this is the art world, so... We have to be specific about those things. And, and, and just it's definitely of the Chosuri family. I know that. <laughs> All right. And, and just out of curiosity, like, why did you decide to do it in three different colors? What do colors mean to you? Um, I think it was more of, more of a function of uh, just, I've always been um, into colorways and, um, I think I just wanted to offer people, you know, a choice. And the funny thing is, uh, out of giving them a choice, it, it made most people sort of want to have, um, we found that most people wanted to collect them all. So we've been very thankful in that way because I'm not, I'm not an author at, you know, I'm someone that like was given like a great opportunity to sort of express my work. And uh, it's just been cool. And, and, and creatively, in your own creative process, um, do colors have special meaning, like in music, for example? Sure. Colors, uh, colors um, actually affect people emotionally. They, it's almost like they, they emote things toward people. And um, we just wanted to keep it very light. I didn't want it to be super heavy and deep, because um, uh, in the music industry when they do books they tend to like really go really deep and I don't know that it's time for that in the ether right now I think it's time for people to feel better and to be you know enlightened and, uh, and be happy and so we, we try to just sort of keep it bright and, and lifting if that makes any sense absolutely Pharrell you've had an incredibly varied career um, you're a performer, producer, leader of a fashion brand, designer, and now an author. What is the through line through all these projects? You know, I treat all projects just like I do music. You just have like, you know, a collection of sounds and it's kind of like your own Lego block building system where you just sort of color coordinate well, well, let me back that up. First of all, you have like an idea, you have, a, you have a, something that you feel like is missing, um, and from there, you sort of figure out what the schematic is gonna be, you, the blueprint, and, um, and then you sort of color code it and, and, and build it. And uh, I find that it, you know, making a chair is not really different from you know, pr making a song. It's, you know, there's a hook, there's legs, you know, there's the seat, there's like the, the verses, um, the hinges or the screws or the, the glue is um, the cord structure. I mean, you could, and by the way, you can switch it out if you guys scientifically feel like, you know, that wasn't a best representation. It, the hook can be the seat if you want, it's fine. <laughs> well, now I know why I can't make a chair. <laughs> <laughs> I think you do a great job. But I, I guess what you're saying is that for you it's all the same creative process and you're just expressing yourselves through different means and mediums. Totally, across different platforms, for sure. And, and by the way, outside of music, and I collaborate in music too, but outside of music, what I really love to do is collaborate with people who have, you know, a, uh, who are far much more learned than I am in those fields because I wanna, I wanna learn. So the key is to not collaborate with someone that, well, the key is to collaborate with someone that I can learn from. That, you know, it's kind of like a, it's like, it's like going to university, but you're, you're being paid for it. Which is what I always tell kids. Like, you know, if you wanna be happy, find something that you love to do that you do for free. And if you could possibly squeeze in two other things, which is to, a way to service humanity and be, to actually get paid from it, then that's a very happy life. And it doesn't matter how much you're making from it, it's, it's the time that you're spending 
that's, if you're spending most of your time doing what you love to do, you've, you've got a pretty happy life. So that's, that's what's cool about it to me. Um, what, what does a music producer do? Just tell us what being a music producer is. Well, there's two types. There is a music producer who walks in the room and kind of like is, you know, he EQs the sounds, meaning, you know, he thinks the bass is too loud or uh, he thinks that the drums are, too, are, are, are not loud enough. He's the guy that comes in and sort of equalizes um, the audio space and, uh, and often has that knack to instruct the bass player or to talk to the vocalist and to sort of speak their language to get something out of them more. It's like uh, to be able to, to pull more and you need to be, and it's, and it's a lot of psychology too when you're dealing with you know, other humans in the room. Um, and then there is the other type of producer who kind of writes most of the material and provides most of the, the background. And that's the kind of producer that I am. Like I've, um, I've written um, my, most of my songs or collaborated in the creative process. Um, and it wasn't just basically moving the furniture around, it was kind of building the chairs too. But so, I respect them both because they're, you know, they are the Phil Spectres and the Quincy Joneses of the world and those guys are the gods of, 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 uh, of what it is that, that I do. So when you're producing, you're actually part of the creative process. Yes, sir. You're, you're collaborating, really, mm -hmm. when you're producing music. Yes, sir. And that, and that probably ties into all of your collaborations. Sure. Is that, is that part of why you've been such a collaborator with other people? Like, I remember the extraordinary piece that's actually up on the screen right now, your collaboration with Murakami. Thank you. And um, it, was, it was amazing. It was in Art Basel, what, three years ago? Yeah, I'm terrible with chronology. So am I. But I remember two things. I remember the piece, because it was a blockbuster at the show. Thank you. And then I remember the after party where you actually performed. Yes, sir. They were both wonderful. Thank you. So when you collaborated with Murakami, what was that like? What was your part and what was his part in that collaboration? Well, I had this wild idea that, um, that we often take uh, the simple things in life for granted, but it's the simple things that bring us joy. So I picked like seven items that like really made me happy, things that I felt like were super essential that most people overlooked, like Johnson's and Johnson's baby lotion. I just like the smell of it, reminds me of like when I was a kid. I love cupcakes. Um, you, there's no way in the world you can go anywhere and not have um, ketchup with your french fries. Uh, and when I was first talking about this, everyone was like, what, why are you doing that? But if you think about it, there's a great, great, great artist named Warhol who did the same thing with Campbell's soup cans, which made people really look at the design of, of those cans very differently because it was an isolated image versus something you'd walk past in an aisle. So I thought, well, and someone brought that up to me too at the same time, and I said, well, I wanted to do something different. I was gonna take you know, this era's way of highlighting things, which is to throw diamonds on everything. And I was so tired of that word bling. And oftentimes I heard or, or read, um, there were times where I was, you know, sort of having these expressions in jewelry and they would say, oh, you know, he's with this bling. And I was like, well, you know what, I'm gonna, oftentimes you have to overdo something to kill it. So I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take it and put it in a positive light. So I took those very simple items, and instead of, um, instead of, uh, instead of, you know, doing a necklace, I thought, you know what? We're going to redo a miniature Pepsi can with enamel and um, white gold and um, white diamonds and... I think that was only white diamonds on that one. 
But the whole key was to have it done in uh, you know, precious metal and precious stones. And my bet was that people would react to it differently. And so well, then when we made the items, everyone was like, wow, you know, pink diamonds for the Johnson & Johnson's baby lotion. Like, you know, they, they completely treated the whole entire thing. And it was such a joke because that was the art piece. The art piece was the reaction to the people. That was my thing. That was, that was what I wanted out of it. And so the only guy that really got it, because everyone was like, oh, my God, where are you going to sell this at Christie's? And I'm like, I totally don't get it. So the only guy that got it was Takeshi. And I went to him and I said, listen, I need to just build like a little carrying case or like a little cabinet or something. And he was like, a carrying case or a cabinet, whatever. <laughs> and he said, explain to me what this is, because I think I know what you're trying to do. And I said, sure. So I explained to them the same thing that I'm explaining to you guys. And that's the monster. The monster is, is society coming to eat these things up and for the wrong reasons. And so that was, it began to be both of our expression where I just went for him to, you know, I went to him because I thought, oh, it'd be interesting to have him build like a little vitrine. Um, and he was like, yeah, get out of here. And he, he was like, he, he wanted to jump on the same expression chain, uh, train that I was on. And that's why you see the big, the big monster sort of swallowing, you know, my favorite things. See, I always just thought that you were putting the lyrics in the monster's mouth. That's another interesting way of looking at it. <laughs> Let's talk about, um, in your book, you mention that you asked Zaha Hadid if she would be willing to collaborate on prefab housing. What about this interests you? What's going on here? Well, again, um, another like, sort of uh, expression of mine. I was looking at the economy and how the subprime sort of took us down all based on like greed. And I thought, you know, the best way for this economy to sort of get, get back is through, you know how they say um, um, in the solution and lies the, uh, excuse me, in the problem and lies the uh, solution. Um, I'm totally screwing it up, by the way, but you guys know what I'm saying. Yeah, we know what you're saying. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm under pressure and there's like, you know, sunbeams coming down on me right now. I mean, things are super hot. You're, you're used to this. I, I don't do this very often. Yes, but I feel like a rotisserie chicken right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, whoa. So, yeah, it was pretty loud. Um, so I thought, you know what, prefab housing. There's Prouvé, who's like super genius guy. Yeah, we had uh, at the last Design Miami show, Patrick Sagan actually had a team that was in the show building and deconstructing every day uh, a Prouvé prefab house. It was incredible. Unbelievable. So the, the Design Miami fans really know what you're talking about. Right. And so if you do the history on him, you know, he sort of... He was trying to, you know, help the cause in Africa with a lot of the original designs. And I thought, you know what? Here's another thing. Like, we live in our phones these days. Like, the phone is actually like the remote control to your life. You know, almost all of your information is there. You kind of don't need a wallet anymore. You, just, you want to buy it, you just, you know, SKU number, gone, done, paid for. I mean, it's like, it's everything. So, and then there are like smart cars um, that are like in nice sizes. And the only thing that, that's left is like to sort of um, change the mentality of like where we live, our dwellings. And uh, traditionally humans functioned on, you know, 500 square foot, you know, in the very beginning. And so I thought mobile homes are, really ugly and sucky and they have become a part of like a really bad stereotype of America. And um, prefab housing is just kind of like really boring, it's something that you'd see in an Edward Scissorhands movie, like the, just the row housing. And I thought, okay, if we could show people that they could actually have something much more quality and super interesting and 
and appetizing to see aesthetically, then we could, we could sort of change the mentality and people could build their homes. They could buy their land and build their homes for cheap um, and actually pay off your home in the same way that you pay off your car. You know, instead of spending 30 years to pay off your home, imagine if you paid off your, you, you paid off your home in eight years. So I thought, okay, well, how do we make that interesting? You've, you've kind of got to go above and beyond. And Zaha Hadid is above and beyond. And so prefab is basically, you know, four walls, a roof, a couple floors. And um, it's mainly uh, constructed with like straight lines and right angles for corners. Well, we, but we know that Zaha doesn't do, she doesn't do either of, uh, of the two. She likes curves and her, she doesn't really have corners, she just has curves. So I thought, for two reasons she'd be great. One, she's never done a prefab, and number two, her, her focus and her way of expressing uh, the uh, energy and the, and the flow of where someone dwells or where someone's gonna work, their workspace is completely different than what a prefab would ever be. So I thought it was like a good challenge for her, which, you know, in her sleep she could do it. Um, and that was the reason why I approached her and I, you know, I asked her and she thought it was a great idea and she said, sure. And then I came to you um, and, you know, you're, you're always amazing with these things because you dream big and you know the right people to sort of get these great things done. So it's been a, it's been a blast. I'll tell you, it occurs to me, whether it's music or art or design, you have an incredible ability to pick collaborators. Do you see yourself as a teacher or a student? 100% a student. I think every day that you're not learning, you're wasting your time. What's, what's a cadult? A cadult is someone who is, is a human being. Uh, I know we're all human beings, but you know, the term human being in these days have, have such insignificance attached to it and there's not enough awe to go along with like this gift of time and the present that we have and there's a reason why they call it the present because it's a gift you know there's there's not enough awe that goes along with the term human being but a cadult is someone who like no matter how old you are you're still a kid at heart and no matter how young you are, you, you, can, you still have the ability to function like an adult. And so it's sort of like this ageless mentality where you're just aiming to learn every moment of the day. Even if it's something emotional from your partner, or it's just a random book, or it's just like an interesting, interesting random fact, like Rick James came from Buffalo, New York. I don't know. But there's always time, right. there's always time to learn something, you know? Like, and that's... Uh, that's what I like to spend my time doing. Now, I know that you went around the show and picked out some of your favorite pieces, and I want to talk about them. But before we talk about your favorite pieces, sure. I want to talk about one of my favorite pieces that's been in Design Miami. Please. And that's the chair that's up on the screen right now. Who designed that? Oh. Um, I worked with uh, these super genius. It's Pharrell's people. chair, just in case. I worked with this, this team called Demo and Perez out of Paris, and they make some of the, they do some of the finest leather work you've ever seen, ever, 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 ever. They do everything from, uh, we did a leather cladded bike um, for Brooklyn Machine Works. Uh, it's pretty expensive, but I mean, it's all based on the fact that the entire thing is cladded in leather and it's, seemingly seamless um, on up to you know doing the upholstery and like the Hermes jet these guys are like unbelievable and I still can't believe to this day that uh, Emmanuel Emmanuel Periton was able to talk them into doing anything with me because I'm just a musician and so uh, I had the idea of um, you know in, here in America we we have these perspective sayings like well sitting from sitting from where you're sitting what's your view you know it's all about perspective or I like to know what it's like to be in her shoes you know that's all a matter of perspective so I tried to take the phrase 
and realize it into, you know, sort of manifest it into a physical expression. And so the seat is like where you're sitting, quote unquote, and um, the men's feet in the back, women's feet in the front, it's kind of like what it was like to be in love. So that was the perspective. Now, depending on the angle that you're looking at the chair, there are other people who have other interpretations of it. <laughs> can't say that I don't disagree or I don't subscribe to that mentality as well. Um, well, I, I have to say, I mean, just in the way of disclosure, because we're at a big audience and everyone's listening and I'm talking about this chair and I really love this chair. In fact, I, I have one in my collection. And if you, you come see the collection at Dacra, right at the entrance is one. I actually even like it better than these because mine's in red and it looks super cool. Thank you. So let's talk about um, some of the stuff at the show. Um, I know you picked out uh, some works by designers here, and it doesn't seem that you have any problem with things that are bold. In fact, the commonality that I saw in all of your favorite objects at the show was their bold use of color. Mm. And obviously, color is a big part of the way you design. Um, do you actually have a favorite palette? You know, that changes. Um, but I think it's like, I think you're well advised to sort of find one that you're comfortable with. Like Wes Anderson, if you look at all of his films, they all have like a consistent thread of a, you know, early 70s color palette. Um, I think but that could be why I just love all his movies. They just feel like great old Kodak commercials. Um, but I, I don't because um, in my world, things become trendy. And when things are cool, it just becomes like super overdone. And so you find yourself, you know, one year I could be all about like turquoise. And then the very next year, it could just be all about like dirt and earth tones. So it, 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 it varies. You know, there was a moment like maybe five or six years ago where everything was chrome. Chrome shoes, chrome pants, chrome jacket, chrome everything, chrome glasses, chrome, chrome hearts, hearts. <laughs> <laughs> chrome cars. Uh, and now it's like you want to just run away from all those things. I, you know, I think. For me, I have to remain open to like all colors because there'll be a time where everything is so one thing that the thing that I thought I'd hate for the rest of my life all suddenly becomes attractive. So, I don't know. I'm seasonal with that. One of the, uh, one of the objects you chose, which is up on the screen, is a desk by Gio Ponti, who's also one of my favorite design, designers. He's, he's so talented in everything he touched, from architecture to design to publishing. Do you collect Gio Ponti? No. I mean, actually, that was my first time uh, finding out about him. But it, well, this was 53, this thing? This piece was 53, I think? It's 50, 53. Yeah, and he, uh, one thing that I found interesting about him, he was trying to make, you know, the office life fun um, and bring a little bit more liveliness and functionality to it. And I thought the pop on the top, meaning the red, was just, sort of made it stood out and, and it gave more, kind of like what I tried to do with my favorite things. It's like when you add a different material to the same exact thing, or in this case, with Geo, um, you add a color to it, it automatically opens a person up and they, they begin to see more than just something that was designed from the 50s. They actually see his perspective. You, you, could, you could just look at it as a desk and walk past it, or you could see the geometry and uh, the, uh, the poetry and what he was trying to create in his lines. And I think that's what the red does very well. Just coming back to the book for a moment, um, you know, in, in my office, uh, there's a little seating area. And for the last six months or so since the book came out, I've had it on this really cool little Wendell Castle table. And I noticed that it's the only book I've ever put out there. Everybody that walks in starts to look at it. And they wanna, it, there's something about it that makes them wanna flip through. And I think one of the things that's, uh, that, that, that's really cool about it is that there's, it, it's all about you and other people. And, and I guess 
you really, as you thought about places, you were really also thinking a lot about people and getting back to collaborations. Well, I owe that to Rizzoli. Um, they approached me about the idea, um, and when I, when I talked to uh, uh, Ian Yuna about it, he, uh, he was very open. And um, he talked to his boss, who was super kind about it as well. Because my thing was, I didn't want to do a book about me. The one thing I hate, 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 H A T, hate, is interviews. And the reason why is because they always want me to talk about me. And I find that so boring. And it's just, after you've done it, I don't know if any of you guys do a lot of interviews, but like you get tired of saying the same thing over and over again, especially when it starts to feel like the person's basically Googled you and the first page is what all the questions are based on. It's, you know. I, I hope you don't feel like I'm interviewing you today. No. Oh, okay, thank God. No, no, no. <laughs> this is a conversation, and all this right. is what I prefer, because it's like, it breathes. You know, I think a conversation is a two-way street. There, they're just sort of, you know, spewing out questions that I know the answers to. Yes, uh, 73, yes, I met Chad when I was 12, yes, you know, that type of thing. But they allowed me to express myself in this way. If I was gonna do a book, I didn't wanna do it about me. I wanted to do it about the people who have inspired me and the people who have offered me different portals from music. Like music all absolutely is the fulcrum point of everything that I am and where I come from. But these other doorways come from Buzz Aldrin, comes from Hans Zimmer, comes from you know a Jay-Z, comes from Anna Wintour, because they saw something in my music and they were like, okay, well, would you like to do this? And it's like, okay, I'll do this with you, but I'm gonna teach you everything. And I thought that was so much more fascinating than to hear something about, like, me, you know? It's like, yeah, okay, cool, but this was cool because, and it was, it was daring because it was a different concept. It's like a book that's my book that's not about me. It's about, like, all of my mentors. And so the name, Places and Spaces, comes from the fact that you know, working with Hans Zimmer in his compound of, called Remote Control. And Hans Zimmer is like super genius, you know, movie score dude, composition writer, genius, really, really, really genius guy. Everything from Batman to like Pirates of the Caribbean to like, uh, you know, Da Vinci Code, where he took the Fibonacci, um, uh, the Fibonacci um, pattern and decided to make music the same way, meaning you could read the music forward and backwards and it would play the same thing. I mean, he is like a genius guy. So to even be in the same room with this guy, I'm like, look, if you really want my, my fans to know something about me, then let's tell them the most important thing, which is collaborate with people you can learn from. And so his compound in LA is a place and having a conversation with him was a space. It allowed me into his mental space. So what I try to do is have these interesting interviews or conversations with these great and fascinating people who have enlightened me. And I figured what you would do is you would listen to Hans's work and then you would read our conversation and through what he was saying and his words and his pacing of how he speaks and his vernacular and the kind of words that he chose to, to, to use as a human, you could sort of listen to his work, take the interview, and somewhere in the middle deduce what it's like to be in his mental space. And I thought that was the ultimate gift that I could give my readers, is to give them that same experience that I got from these great people. Wow. Should we, should we shift from the two-way conversation to the multi-way conversation? Sure. And make this a bigger conversation? I know that was very long-winded. That was like it was, a, no, was like it, a, was, it was actually the perfect summation of the process that we've been talking about. It, it kind of described everything. Uh, just thought I'd kind of uh, ask you open, open-ended question. You're, uh, impre you've been spending a lot of time down here in Miami. Your impression of the Miami aesthetic, uh, the development that's going on, all of that. 
I love Miami. I think Miami is one of the greatest cities in the world um, because of the cultural diversity. It's like a melting pot. But um, it's diverse in a lot of ways and not just with, uh, with the demographics. It's like, you know, there's a different interesting mix of, of interest in themselves and there's not much that, you, that you'd look for that you can't find. Whereas in other places, it happens to sway in you know, one or two ways. Uh, I just love the idea that Miami just offers so much to so many people. And I mean, think about it, like they're having, you know, they have Basel here, you know, they have the Design Miami here, you know, and the people that are from here are aspiring to, to bring even more culture and more stimulation to the various areas. What Craig has done with uh, the design district is nothing short of amazing. I mean, this guy's completely transformed something that was more like a warehouse district to like a real true staple in, in design and art and fashion. And uh, it's just amazing to see. Down now now to that I think about it, you discovered me too. <laughs> <laughs> he did. Pharrell told me for a long time, he said the design district is gonna be so big, you can't imagine what's gonna happen here. I think he saw it before I did. Well, you know what, you actually, you know, you brought it to fruition. Thank you. Know, you. It's, and it's always been a, a seed. So I saw a, a lady a few rows back, yes, with her hand up. We'll get the mic to you. Hi, Pharrell. My question Hello. is that now that you've had this experience of putting a book together and conversations with all of these people that have come into your life the past, you know, however old, old you are, <laughs> moving forward, how do you think the experience of writing the book is going to affect your life and, more importantly, your music? Uh, I, I'm enjoying it. I am. I don't like getting on the plane so much, but, um, it's kind of like why I kind of slowed down from performing. It's the plane, plane back. Anybody that travels a lot, you know what I'm talking about. The airplane back. It's not so fun. Um, but I like, I like this book thing. I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's cool because you're able to sort of get information out in a different way. I mean, you know, there's a book called Neuro Linguistic Programming that teaches you about um, how different people receive information. There are some people who are like uh, uh, visually poised people. There are people who are more auditory, people more kinesthetic. And you'll know it, symptoms of such and characteristics of such is when a person says, oh, I see what you're saying. That's a visual person. Or when someone says, you know what, I just don't get a good feeling. That's a kinesthetic person. Or someone says, uh, yeah, you know, it, it doesn't really ring a bell. They just naturally associate to those submodalities. Sub and I'm finding that there are people who are more, like there are other people who enjoy my music, but they're much more avid reader, readers. And so this is a way that I'm able to communicate and connect with them a little bit better than I was able to in music. Everyone's not gonna like your music. They may like you as a person or not, but you know, it's, 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 it's enabling me to offer a different platform. And I promise to the Rizzoli people, that's not a plug to allow me to do another book. But it kinda is. Fred Bernstein, could we convince you to ask a question? You're such a smart guy. I don't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, thank you, Craig. Uh, Pharrell, which way do you process information? Are you kinesthetic, uh, visual? I think I'm auditory first. Um, I'm also a synesthete, meaning when I hear the music, I'm, I associate them with colors. It's not as rare as it sounds. It just kind of sounds cool. Uh, synesthete is a, is a noun tense of the, the word synesthesia. You know, one who has, um, who associates different senses in the same way. So um, I, I think I'm an auditory learner, but at the same time, I'm also a visual person and then I kind of feel mu music too, like when I hear it, there are certain chords that kind of make you emotional. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not rare, like there's a reason why the blues are called the blues. Um, 
and, and if you look, most, most musicians are. But I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of confused in the area. I don't know. I think I'm auditory just because I kind of gra gravitated toward music first. But uh, it could be a blend. I'm, I'm not sure. It sounds like you're all of the above. Sounds That's like what I was sounds thinking. Like, sounds like I'm confused. No, not no, at no, all. No, no, no. You just not at you all. have it all. <laughs> Anybody else? There's a gentleman up here. So uh, you said that you try to, in your work and um, in your life, you try to stay ahead of being way too trendy. So is there, um, are there any constants in your life or your work, or is that even important? Is there? Like, are there any constants? Is there anything that, um, you know, is just a, throughout all your work? Is Constant. There, yeah. Oh. Like a thread. Uh, yeah. Um, just, I think you can sort of, I think one person, well, I can't tell you, but I, I, my assumption is that I think people can hear the curiosity in all of my work. Like, I'm always, like, looking for something, but I kind of look for it my way. You know, there's, like, doctors, right? And they, you know, there's different ways to treat a cold, but it's the way of your doctor that sort of tells you the difference between that doctor and the next. And so I'm always searching for, like, new answers, new directions, but I kind of use the same tools. Again, like, kind of like, like a Wes Anderson or a Spike Lee. Those guys are very specific in their work. You know a Spike Lee movie when you see one. You know a Wes Anderson movie. Not to say one is better than the other. Um, but you, there's, a, there's a way that I, that I think is, is, is mine. Um, but I don't think that that is as consistent as my sort of being a slave to the curiosity and just dying to know where else can I go with things. Because I think, you know, I was once asked, like, what inspires me? And, I, and I, I always say that which doesn't exist. You know, I try to, like, use the negative spaces that people sort of overlook to create from because I think all the other things are, are just kind of overdone. You're very quotable. <laughs> Incredibly quotable. Uh, I know that woman. Hi. Um, I noticed that you've mentioned Wes Anderson, and now um, you know you've definitely had kind of a visual film thing going on. Can we expect a film from you anytime soon? Uh, we're working on a musical with Imagine, um, but it's a it's a film, obviously, um, and it takes place in 1973, the year that I was born. And it just sort of talks about like life in Virginia uh, at that time, which I think is, was triumphant and, and sort of tragic at the same time, based on a lot of things. It takes place in the projects, obviously. Uh, that's where I, where I come from. But, um, but I just thought it would be interesting to sort of offer a musical that did something different than da 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 You know, I thought I would just sort of give it like a complete different slant or look at a musical from a different facet um, than usual. So I, I think it's going to be interesting if, they, if, if I'm able to make it as, uh, as honest and um, as more independent feeling as, as I think I am, you know. I, I, don't, I don't see myself as commercial. Um, some people will say, yeah, right. But I think it's going to be interesting. Can we, can we get a little sound bite from your musical? We heard what it's not going to be. <laughs> uh, next question. <laughs> There's a gentleman back there that has a question. Sorry for all, I couldn't resist. No, no worries, no worries. He's still writing. Hello, Pharrell. Uh, yes. I'm Matt Hevermel. Thank you for everything that you do. I just want to ask, we've talked about the creative side of things. I'm more curious about, you know, when you're not being creative, how do you, you know, daily, how are you keeping track of your different business interests and, the, you know, the production to the close? And, you know, how do you balance the two? And, 
you know, every day is there a certain schedule like I have to check in with these people to make sure that everything's taken care of or you know, keeping your business things close to home or how do you, I guess, defining people to trust to run those other things to make sure you're taking care of everything. Oh, or, oh man, it's super simple. <laughs> no social life. Right. That's it. Just only have really t like time for like uh, my family and then my work. But yeah, but to be honest, yeah, no social life. Like I really don't, that's the one thing I don't really get to do so much. So, but it's okay, because I love going to the movies. Like I love going to the movies. Going to the movies and like eating at my favorite restaurants, Pub Belly. Um, you guys been to Pub Belly? You have to go. <laughs> or like Yardbird, or Michael's. Michael's is here, by the way, if anyone's hungry. They yeah. set up a temporary cafe in, it's so in good. Design Miami. It's so good. But yeah, that's, that's it. I mean, and uh, as much as I try to make it sound simple, it's, it is, it is, it, it's a thing. But you make that, you make that choice. And um, it's cool because I'm more addicted to, you know, being able to create. And come on, man, I'd much rather talk to Zaha Hadid and bug the shit out of her than like then hang out in the street so I, I have to admit it's true um, I don't think there's I ever see you whether it's in the day or at night where you aren't going and coming from work right you, you, you come from work to the wherever we're meeting and then you go back to work yes sir you are you put in a lot of hours mainly in the studio yeah mainly the studio and then there's all the fashion stuff so and that keeps me it keeps me busy, and then I spend like a significant amount of time at home with my family as well. Looks like you spend a lot of time shopping also. That's not a, an easy outfit. Well, this is, this is a Beeline from BBC by Mark McNary. We're lucky enough to work with him. Um, so that, the thing, that's one of the luxuries. You get to make what you want to wear. It saves time. Yeah, it saves time. You don't have to shop. No, not much. But then I don't love a lot of brands either. There's only like four or five brands that I like love. So. I think the, the gentleman over here. But by the way, let me just clarify something. We're joking up here, but I'm not, I know how blessed I am. Don't, please don't think that I'm like, oh yeah, I just make what I want. No, I'm a super lucky guy. And I'm lucky in the sense that I was like at the right place at the right time to be around super smart people who have been gracious enough to collaborate with me like a Mark McNary or like Billionaire Boys Club, my brand, and all the people that, 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 that work with me, with Zoli. Like all of my partnerships, I've been extremely lucky and blessed. So we're joking up here, but I'm not that guy. I know how lucky and blessed I am. I mean, you guys don't even have to be like sitting out there like listening to us up here. Like I know that. So I, that's important for me to stress to you all. I don't want anyone to get the wrong impression. I, I know how, and you have no idea how thankful I am. So let's take one more question and then we'll... Hey, for real. I'll drink. Um, I would like to know, like, because I shop um, for your clothing line, BBC, and I would like to know why speak, certain things... Speak louder cause into the mic. It just. I would like to know, like, why certain things that's not on your website that you wear, because, you know, I always shop on there, too, and I would like to buy certain things that you wear, but I never see it online. Oh, because sometimes I make... That's a good question. Sometimes I make things for myself, and then the team are like... So I'm like, cool, so are we going to go to market? And they're like, no because sometimes it's a little too out there. Like, there was a minute where I was like wearing like these drop crotch jeans and they were like, no, we're not doing it. And, and I, was also, I was almost like ready to like sort of arm wrestle everyone in the office, but they were right because now it's like everyone. You know, I don't know if you saw the AMAs, but it was kind of like the Hammer Time show, like everyone. And so, you know, of course I retired them because like once I saw that it was just kind of like, I'm like watching the AMAs and I had all those shorts in the fireplace like <laughs> yep goodbye so that's what happens sometimes I kind of like jump out the window and uh, it's not always appropriate and it's sort of cool to sort of have things that like people may want but they can't get so it's not such a bad thing at the same time but that's why and thank you for your question it was a it was a great question so, um, 
Anything else you want to say? Are there any closing thoughts? You said a lot, so. Um, more than anything, man, thank you guys. Like, thank you. Like, you guys have been like the wind beneath my wings. There's no, there is, there's none of this, man. And if there's any English teachers out there, please don't hold it against me. Um, but there's, there's none of this without you guys. And uh, I just know how fortunate I am, and this, is, this has been such a cool roller coaster ride. We, we have one more guest that may want to ask a question. Alex, does anyone else want to ask a question? Or? For real, I wanted to ask you <laughs> just about you know, your taste in art and how you develop such a high taste level and influence so many people around the world through you know, pop culture and music and the visuals. Mr. West, how you doing? <laughs> I'm good. Thanks for joining us. Um, to be honest, uh, just hanging around the right people, you know, and, and being unafraid to, to learn and not feeling like I know it all, that's been like one of the greatest lessons ever. Because you know, we're artists, so we have these instincts where we're like, no, but you don't understand, that color's cooler. And they're like, no, but you don't understand. There's much more than just the, the, the aesthetic. There's a function to it. And then so when you sort of do the history and you learn why, then you realize that like there's much more to it than just like a cool colorway. And that's a, pro that's a product of like coming from the projects because when we would get dressed, it was all about like being able to, you know, see it in this color and see it in that color. But then when you step into this real world of like art, design and fashion, you realize that all great things are made from a functional viewpoint first. And that was one of the greatest lessons I had to learn. So that's probably why. Just like you. <laughs> Kanye West, everybody.